Good morning. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord this early in the morning. May God richly bless you for being here. Uh, this is a nice crowd. I'm not sure how warm you are. Actually, I don't know some of you. I'm not sure how nice you are. But I hope you're nice. You're nice to be here. Thank you so much for coming to the house of the Lord and pray that God will use me as his servant and as his minister this morning. I'm telling you, I have heard uh, Mark Williams and I have heard Brother Hill before. Those are two of the most awesome messages I've heard in a long time. God has blessed our church with great leadership, great revelation, and I'm so thankful for his blessings. Yesterday, I started into a series of messages that I've entitled Forward Together in Holiness in Changing Times. These are changing times, aren't they? When you compare where we have come from to where we are now, things have changed. The church has changed tremendously. Now, I was born and raised in this great organization, and I love it with all of my heart. The only time I strayed from it was a time of alcoholism and drug addiction during my teen years. But I grew up uh, sleeping on concrete floors and sleeping on church benches and watching the Holy Spirit come down in a mighty way and touch great men of God with almost visible anointings. And I've been through the church through a tremendous amount of changes. I know it's hard to believe, as young looking and handsome as I am, that I'm 57 years old. And I've been in this church for quite some time, and I've seen a lot of changes. Some good, some bad. But we're talking about keeping a sense of holiness in the midst of these changing times. Yesterday, I laid a foundation, an introduction to a book by John G. Gammy entitled Holiness in Israel. He presents God's revelation to Old Testament Israel through the three major ministries of the Old Testament the ministry of the priest, the ministry of the prophet, and the ministry of the sages, or the wise men. Yesterday, we looked at the priest. God gave his revelation very early that holiness requires separation and cleanness. And throughout the Old Testament, we will see there may be great diversities of opinion on what holiness requires. To the priest, they have their opinion of what it means to be holy. To the prophets, there is a second opinion on what it means to be holy. And to the wise men, there is a third opinion on what it means to be holy. But in spite of all of their diversities of opinions, there was one or two things they had in common. They all believed. Holiness requires separation unto God. They all believe holiness requires cleanliness, living a clean life, being clean before God. Whether you have to come bring your sacrifices and offer them to the Lord on the altar, you have to be clean. In the prophetic times, they're condemned for not living clean lives in society. And as we'll see in the wisdom literature later on this week, they are condemned because they do not have personal integrity, individual sense of right and wrong, apart from the church and the community, apart from prophetic preaching. You just have to have some sense. This morning, I'm going to move away from that priestly perspective to a certain degree. From the priestly perspective, God gave them all of this revelation at Mount Sinai. Everybody say Mount Sinai. 
At Mount Sinai, God gave his rules and regulations for being holy. He set aside a holy tabernacle for them to worship in. He set aside holy times such as the Sabbath, holy convocations such as the Feast of Passover, the Feast of, of uh, Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles, times in which all of Israel, once they were settled in, would have to migrate to this holy tabernacle on these holy times and make holy offerings. He laid down dietary laws. He laid down garment laws. He laid down all kinds of rules and regulations, a priestly mentality of holiness primarily dominated by a legalistic lifestyle. The laws were given. And there are some principles that we cannot abandon. We don't live by all of those laws anymore. Our life is not based at Mount Sinai. It is based on Mount Zion. The laws had certain principles that we still need to apply to our lives. But today, let's fast forward hundreds of years and we're going to look at Ezekiel as we move into the second chapter of this man's book, of Gammy's book. We're going to look at variations on the priestly understanding of holiness. We'll look at Ezekiel, possibly have time for some of his successors, and the chronistic work of history. The chronistic work of history, is, it, it simply means, okay, you have the time of Ezekiel, which is during Babylonian captivity. We've gone way beyond the revelation at Mount Sinai. We've traveled through the wilderness. We've entered into the Canaan land. And after all of those years in the Canaan land of the struggles and kings and prophets and and priest, we finally end up in captivity in Babylon. In 587 BC, all of that's taken into Babylon. And there we have two major prophets to emerge. Ezekiel emerges in the captives in Babylon. So times have changed. We're not out Mount Sinai with the fire on the mountain and the smoke and the trembling and the laws. We've come a long ways since then. And we come to the book of Ezekiel and times are drastically different. And what we will see in the book of Ezekiel, and if we have time, which I sincerely doubt, we will look at Ezra and Nehemiah. We're going to look at that because they come immediately after that Babylonian captivity. And the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, subsequent to Ezekiel, will also have certain perspectives of holiness. So we're going to see a tremendous amount of change today. The amazing thing about Ezekiel is he was a prophet and a priest. He was raised in a priestly home with all of the priestly background. He knew about the temple. He knew about the Sabbath day. He knew about the Ark of the Covenant. He knew about sacrifices. He was raised in it. He understands the whole history of the holiness movement of the priest in the Old Testament. But he's also a prophet. And he sees things that you just don't see when you're just a priest. He's elevated to a different level and God gives him visions. There are four major things about the book of Ezekiel. His understanding of the history of God's dealings with his people. His understanding of the holy name of God, his visions and the requirements he lays down for holiness. 
four things. We may not even get to all of Ezekiel's because we really want to look at what Ezekiel understands about history. How God has dealt with his people. We really want to look at his perspective on God's holy name. And we really want to look at his perspective that God has given him, the visions of Ezekiel. I know you've just been seated, but would you stretch your hand this way and pray that God will touch us today. That God will use me as his servant and as his minister. Father, my heart is is touched with your holiness this day. It is overwhelmed with the word of the Lord. I pray that you will touch me as your servant and as your minister, for I am my best when I'm nothing but a vessel through whom you operate. Help me somehow step aside beyond myself and operate in your ability. Let the Holy Spirit that makes preaching easy touch me this morning and strengthen me for your service. May your word go forth and accomplish that which is pleasing in your sight. And I will give you the praise and the glory and the honor. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. John G. Gammon describes Ezekiel as the theologian of the holiness of God. He said Ezekiel evolved his doctrine of holiness with the consciousness and in the manner of a theologian. A theologian is one who thinks out the meaning of the faith in a logical, consistent, coherent, and systematic fashion. Of all the authors in the Hebrew Bible, Ezekiel above all merits this title. Think about what he's just said. He said, above all authors in the Hebrew Bible, Ezekiel deserves to be called a theologian. What is a theologian? A theologian is one who thinks things through in a logical, consistent, coherent, and systematic fashion. In other words, everything Ezekiel discovers is not just a process of divine intervention and revelation. It's not something that God has overwhelmed him with. He will have visions. But some things he just thought about. He just tried to figure it out. And as he sat back and thought about the situation they're in, his mind just started scanning history. And in all of the history of the people of Israel, he started putting some things together. He started understanding things that were consistent that were coherent and that were systematic. It doesn't matter what Israel's going through. It doesn't matter the changes, the difficulties, the hardship. Doesn't matter what's been lost or gained. Doesn't matter what used to be and what is now. He looks through all of it and he begins to see some things that are consistent. He begins to see some things that happen repetitively. No matter what's going on, this is the way God is. And this is what God will do. A theologian. And what he discovers, you will see in the book of Ezekiel, 63 times. He he uses the phrase, so that you may know, I am the Lord. So no matter what's going on, he looks back over history and he sees the way God has done things. He looks at the acts of God, the behavior of God. And he sees this systematically, 
consistently, constantly, in everything God has done, in all of the history of Israel, Ezekiel's just kind of put it all together and he says, you know what? Everything God does, he does so that you may know he is the Lord. When you begin to look at the history of holiness in Israel, you may want to turn in your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 20. I, I don't know, if I'm telling you guys, we're going to just go somewhere today. We're going to pack up and move into the word of the Lord. And I hope you're with me. I hope you brought your Bible. But we, we're going to look at the history of holiness from Ezekiel's perspective in, in Israel's history. He sees in Ezekiel chapter 20, he sees three phases in Israel's history. Three phases that are extremely significant. And if you begin to look for the phrase that God did what he did in Israel's history, not because of Israel, but because of who he is and what he is. His actions are based on what it will do in reflecting his name. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 5 through 10, we have the first phase in Israel's history. This is what the sovereign, the Lord says, on the day I chose Israel, I swore with an uplifted hand to the descendants of the house of Jacob and revealed myself to them in Egypt with an uplifted hand. I said to them, I am the Lord your God. On that day, I swore to them that I would bring them out of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, a land flowed with milk and honey, the most beautiful of all lands. And I said unto them, each of you, get rid of the vile images you have set your eyes on. Do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. When they rebelled against me and would not listen to me, they did not get rid of the vile images they had set their eyes on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. So I said, I'll pour out my wrath on them and spend my anger against them in Egypt. But, look at verse 9. For the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profaned. In the eyes of the nations they lived among and in whose sight I had revealed myself to the Israelites by bringing them out of Egypt. Therefore, I led them out of Egypt and brought them into the desert. You know what God is saying? Or Ezekiel, rather, has figured out. He looked back all the hundreds of years ago when, when Israel were slaves in Egypt. And God said, you know what? I told them, even when they were slaves in Egypt, they spent 400 years there. And the Lord said, I told them, if you will just forsake your idols, those Egyptian idols that you've set your eyes on, then I'll bring you out and I'll deliver you and set you free. But you know they didn't do that. They kept those idols. Even when God brought them out of Egypt, they brought Egyptian idols out in their backpacks. Think about it. Even after God had sent all of the plagues, after God had the Passover lamb slain, the blood on the doorpost, sent his destroying angel into Egypt and grabbed the whole of Israel and brought them out. He didn't do that because they were holy. He did not do that because they were living according to all the laws and the rules. He didn't do that because they were good people, nice people, sweet people. He did that for his name's sake, for his own glory. It's as if God looked down and he said, look, my people are in bondage. They're slaves in Egypt. But you know what? 
I lifted my hand and I said to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I will bring you out of Egyptian bondage. I'll set you free. And now how does it look on me for my children to be in bondage and in slavery? So God, out of his mercy and compassion for his own name's sake, not because of Israel's righteousness, but for his own name's sake. God reached down in Egypt and pulled a defiled, idolatrous people out of bondage. Not because of their reputation, but because of his. They're messing up my name. And then he looks at a second phase in Israel's history, and it's when they reach Mount Sinai in the wilderness, and God gives them all of the rules and the regulations and the laws. And it begins in chapter 20, verse 11, I gave them my decrees, made known unto them my laws, for the man who obeys them will live by them. I gave them the Sabbaths as a sign. Look at verse 13, yet the people of Israel rebelled against me in the desert. They did not follow my decrees, but rejected my laws. Although the man who obeys them will live by them, they utterly desecrated my Sabbaths, so I would pour out my wrath on them and destroy them in the desert. But, look at verse 14. For the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profane in the eyes of the nation, in whose sight I had brought them out. Also, with uplifted hand, I swore to them in the desert that I would not bring them into the land that I had given them, a land flowing with milk and honey, a beautiful land, because they rejected my laws and my decrees. Their hearts were devoted to idols, yet I looked on them with pity and did not destroy them or put an end to them in the desert. Do you know what he's doing now? Not only did God reach down in Egypt and grab an idolatrous people and pull them out, but now they're in the, in, the, in the wilderness and he said, I gave you my laws, I gave you the tent, I gave you the tabernacle, I gave you the, the, the commandments, I gave you all the rules and regulations and I said, live Bob, but they didn't. And I'm telling you, I almost killed them in the wilderness. But then what would the rest of the world say if they looked around and said, yeah, God brought his people out here in the desert and they all died. So for my name's sake, I didn't kill you in the wilderness. I brought you through it. And again, it's not because of your holy living, not because you've done everything right, but it's because it's a reflection on my name. I have redeemed you and brought you out here and told you to live right, but you haven't. But I still have mercy and compassion and pity on you because you are a reflection of my name. And if that's not enough, he got them to the borderline of Canaan and brought them on into the Canaan land. That's phase three. It's the second generation in the wilderness. That begins with verse 18. I said to their children in the desert, do not follow the statutes of your fathers or keep their laws or defile yourselves with their idols. I'm the Lord your God. Follow my decrees. Be careful and keep my laws. Keep my Sabbath. Again, he's laying down the regulations. But guess what? They didn't do it. And yet, look at verse 22. He almost killed them. And yet, for the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nation. I'll disperse them among the nations, scatter them through the countries. You know what he's saying now? He has looked at three phases. He's in Babylon. He's in Babylonian captivity. And he's looked back and he said, you know what? I think I got this figured out. It was for God's holy name 
he reached down in Egypt and brought these slaves out. He brought them to Mount Sinai and almost killed them there, but it would have been a bad reflection on his holy name. So he brought them through the wilderness. He didn't even really want to give them Canaan because of their constant failures. But he brought them on in the Canaan land anyway and he said, I will scatter you sooner or later. But for right now, it's a bad reflection on my name if I don't give you the Canaan land. What Ezekiel understands is the holiness of God will be preserved by God himself. When God looks down, oh, we're in changing times. We've gone through a lot of changes, believe me. We can look back over the history of Israel and see that they were not living right. They were not holy. They were not keeping his laws. They were not living the priestly life. And yet God intervened anyway out of his mercy and compassion. He brought them out of Egypt for his namesake. He brought them through the wilderness for his namesake. He brought them into the Canaan land for his namesake. I want you to understand this is not about us. It's about him. When we were nobodies, God brought us out of slavery and bondage. When we were disobedient, God still kept his hand on us and led us on toward his promises. It's because you and I are a reflection of the God we serve. When people look at us, they should not see us. They should see that God is a holy God who redeems people who are unworthy. Can you say amen? Give the Lord a hand of praise for his blessings. You can look at us and the changes we've gone through in the Pentecostal movement. God poured out his spirit around the turn of the century in the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina, in Topeka, Kansas, and in uh, Azusa Street in California, a little spot down in Texas, a little spot up in Minnesota. God started pouring out his spirit all over the country. And it's not because we're holy. It's not because we've been living right. God wants a people that'll be a reflection of his glory and his name. Can you say amen? When you look at the transitions the church has gone through in our generation, in the generation of a hundred years, we face persecution. That didn't stop us. We, we've had preachers shot out of pulpits. We've had churches dynamited. Oh, that don't stop us. The Holy Ghost moves on. He's still ministering to a people for his namesake and for his glory. Fanaticism like to wipe this out. Fanaticism did more to destroy the church at the turn of the century than dynamite. And yet we've marched on. We've marched through rules and regulations. We've marched through general assembly changes in the minutes. We've changed the way we look. We've changed the way we dress. We've changed where we go, what we do. We have changed a lot of things. And the reason God has still got his hand on us is not because we're living right and we're doing everything holy. We are not a priestly people anymore. Mount Sinai is not our rules and regulations. We are based on the mercy and the grace of God that's founded in Jerusalem. Can you say amen? He has for his name's sake raised up a holy people under the Lord. I'll tell you, the second thing to notice is not just what God has done in history, but what he's done regarding his holy name. Ezekiel locks on to that phrase. Let me give you a couple of verses. Ezekiel 36, I had pity for my holy name. As a matter of fact, verse 22, therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake which you have profaned among the heathen. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 39. 
If you will not hearken unto me, but pollute my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. You know what God is saying? If you're not going to listen to me, I don't want your gifts. I don't want your sacrifices. You're just profaning my holy name. In Ezekiel 39, 7, I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. Verse 25, thus, thus saith the Lord, I will bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. Ezekiel locks in to the significance that God intervenes in history. Listen to me now. God intervenes in history for the preservation of his holy name. We have lost a respect for the holy name of God. There was one professor at a school of theology in Germany that would not even pronounce the name of God. He always spoke, even in his classes, he would say, Y-H-W-H, which is an abbreviation for Yahweh. He wouldn't even speak the name of God. You think that's crazy? We went to Israel. I took my wife to Israel. And our guide, a precious, precious Jewish woman who has now been converted to Christianity, said at the end of that trip, please don't email me and use the name of God in your email. She said, because if you email me and say, thank you for this wonderful trip in Israel, God really blessed me. She said, if the name of God is in that email, I cannot delete it. She said, I have gotten so many emails from people that use the holy name of my God. I have gone through computer after computer after computer because I will never delete his name. Have you ever seen the Jews standing at the wailing wall? They write their prayers on little pieces of paper and they just fold them up as small as they can and push them in the cracks between those blocks on the western wailing wall. And they fill every little crevice and every little hole with prayers that have the name of God on them. And those little names, those little tiny pieces of prayer are never just taken out and thrown in a trash can. They're never taken out and burned somewhere. They get to be so many piled in there, they have to clean them out. But when they clean them out, the Jews even of this day go in and clean all the prayers out of that wailing wall and they put them in big clay preserved vessels and take them out and bury them in the desert. They will never destroy the name of a holy God. You and I are a reflection of the God we serve. And when we use his name glibly and we use his name without respect and do honor, I want you to know there will come a time when God will intervene if people are no longer honoring his holy name. As Israel began to respect the name of God, 
or fail to respect the name of God, whether it's in Egypt or whether it's in the wilderness or whether it's in Canaan, when they fail to respect the holy name of God, he said, I'm going to kill you graveyard dead. I'll raise up another generation who love me and love my name. They'll lift up my holy name. I want to move very quickly to, uh, oh Lord, boy, I'm skipping. I'm skipping so much. But I just got to move on. Just, just forget this guy because there are some things that I want to show you in the Word of God. My dear friend, let's go to the theology of the holiness of God. Slide 22, way over there. The theology of the holiness of God is the theology of His glory, His power, His presence. His wonderful, wonderful divine intervention. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you what, just pick up your Bible. I told you. I put that outline together for you, but I'm liable to stray at any given moment. You know, I can study anybody from anybody's background, any kind of background. John G. Gammy, who put together the, the book entitled The Holiness of Israel, was not a Pentecostal, Bible-thumping Bible Belt believer like you and I are. But I can study him and I can work through the differences and I can extract the valuable information. I can look up the verses that he uses and I can go to those verses myself and extract the information to say if I agree with this guy or if I don't. I can pick up the most liberal scholars in the world and read their information and decide if I'm going to swallow it or not. One of the best writers I ever found on the Gospel of John was Raymond E. Brown. Guy gave revelation that's unbelievable. I discovered he's Catholic. That's fine. I can work through all of that. And I can delete wasn't, doesn't, what doesn't fit with my spirit and my, my understanding and my concentration on the word of the Lord. But I will swallow everything this book has to say. I'll swallow it from cover to cover. I don't have to worry about these theologians. I don't have to worry about whether they're right or wrong in certain things. So there are times when I just shove aside everything and look into this book because it's a book of all books. I don't need an outline for this book. This is what I believe. This is what I live by. This is what I understand. I can look into these pages and get revelation myself. And get understanding myself and swallow it hook, line, and sinker. Sometimes it's sweet. Sometimes it's bitter. But I believe it all. Can you say amen? How many of you have a Bible? Yeah, give the Lord a hand of praise. How many of you have a Bible this morning? I want to show you something. God gives Ezekiel three visions. They're, they're long. But in his whole period in captivity, the boy had three visions. And this is what elevated him from a priestly status into a prophetic status. Prophets see. They used to be called seers, S-E-E-R-S, -E because they see. They see things that other people don't see. They understand things that other people don't understand. And Ezekiel went far beyond just living a priestly life into a prophetic revelation. I want you to remember, yesterday I gave you the aspects of holiness by a guy named uh, Rudolf Otto. When you come into the presence of holiness, there's fear, there's overwhelming sense of danger. There's, there's, there, that's why prophets would see God in his holiness and fall on their face. 
They would see his glory, which is emblematic of his holiness, and fall on their face. Ezekiel had three of those things. And I'm fixing to show them to you. Open your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 8. Now remember, he is in Babylonian captivity. He's by the river Kibar. And God picked him up in the spirit and transported him back over to Jerusalem. I'm going to show you some stuff. In chapter 8 is this transfer. Imagine, God picked him up in the spirit and carried him what would have been a four-month journey by foot and showed him Jerusalem where they used to worship. And the Lord said to him, as soon as they started moving toward Jerusalem, God showed him four things. Look at verse 5. This is the first vision. I lifted up my eyes in the middle part of the verse. I lifted up my eyes toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar was an image of jealousy. It's an idol. And the Lord said in verse 6, Do you see what they do? That the house of Israel committeth here, this is in the house of God, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? You know what God is saying to Ezekiel? Picked him up, brought him over there, and showed him the temple of God. And he said, the first thing he saw was an idol. And God said, you want to know why I'm leaving? You want to know why I'm going to pack up and pull my glory out of here? He said, I'll show you something else. And look at, look at verse, verse 7. He brought him and to the door of the court. We're talking about God's sanctuary. And when I looked, he saw a hole in the wall. And God led him over there and he dug the hole out a little bit larger. And behind the hole was a, was a door going into a private room. And on the inside of that private room, look at verse 11. There stood 70 elders worshiping idols in the house of God. And the Lord said in verse 12, do you see what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chamber of his imagery, they say the Lord does not see us. God has brought him over to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. First thing he saw was an idol. Then he saw in the back of the temple of God where they had created a private chamber. And they would go inside in the house of God now, go inside and worship idols in a private place in the dark where they think God does not see them. Holiness is what you do in the dark. Holiness is determined by what you do when you think God's not watching. He said, I'm going to show you something else. And these were elders. These were leaders. And the Lord said, I'm going to show you something else. And he picked him up again. And he said, <clears throat> in verse 3, he saw, in the latter part of the verse, women weeping for Tammuz, which was an idol of fertility. 
in the house of God now, the women are worshiping an idol. And if that's not enough, he took him to the inner court of the house of the Lord. And in verse 16, look what he saw. 25 men on the inner sanctuary of God. He saw 25 men between the porch and the altar. And they were worshiping the sun. They had their backs. You remember yesterday I told you the high priest never just glibly walked into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. He would come with tremendous sacrifice and awesome fear and respect and love for the Lord, knowing if I mess up, God's gonna kill me. And he would ease inside of that veil, have to go sideways a little bit, come in and make sure his sins are covered. And then he would back, back out. He never turned his back on God He'd watch that Ark of the Covenant as he backed back out very safely and securely. And as soon as he got on the outside, he was okay. But here you have men with their back to the Holy of Holies and their face in the east so they can worship the sun. Can you believe what's going on in the house of God? God said to Ezekiel, you, you want to know why I'm going to leave? You want to know why we're not having a holiness outpouring in the temple? You would be amazed at what folks bring into this house. They may be in the house, but they've brought all kinds of mess with them. They're worshiping all kinds of idols. They think God don't see them in the dark. They think God's not watching their lives. They walk into my house and their mind's not on me. Their face is not toward me. Their hearts are not toward me. These are not holy people. They're looking in the opposite direction even while they're in the house of the Lord. And you want to know why I packed my bags and pulled out of Jerusalem. I want to show you something in verse in chapter 9. Look at it. God's not through with him yet. He's standing there watching all this going on in the house of God. You want to talk about changing times. It's amazing what goes on in the house of the Lord nowadays. Look at verse three. I'm gonna show you some verses. Preachers, pastors, laymen, take your pens, pencils, and mark these. You're gonna wanna get this now. I got this long before I got a hold of John G. Gammy's book. Look at verse 3. Chapter 9, verse 3. The glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub where he was to the threshold of the house. Now, look in chapter 10, verse 4. The glory of the Lord went from the cherub and stood over the threshold and the house was filled with the cloud. The court was full of his brightness. And in verse 5, the angel's wings could be heard even to the outer court and the voice of the Almighty when he spoke. Look in verse 18. The glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house that stood over the cherubims. And in verse 19, you'll find him standing at the door of the east gate. Now look in chapter 11, still the same vision. Verse 23, the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood 
upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. That's the Mount of Olives. And afterwards, the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God to Chaldea and to them that were in captivity. Now, I want to tell you what's going on here. God brought him over there, Pastor. He said, I'm going to show you something, Ezekiel. I'm going to show you why I left church. Have I got your attention, folks? I had, I had one couple to leave a church one time. I didn't even contact them. I didn't call them. They didn't call me. They didn't contact me. Somebody asked me, don't you want to know why they left? I said, no, I don't want to know why they left. I've heard every reason in the world why people leave church. And I don't like none of them. Unless they've relocated, the job's got them somewhere, or they're serving in Afghanistan or Iraq. You can leave church then. But God said, you want to know why I left church? He said, come on, Ezekiel, let me show you. Brought him over here, and he showed him an idol at the door. He showed him 25 people in a private chamber worshiping idols. He showed them women facing uh, a, fertil a fertility God worshiping. He showed them men that are worshiping the sun. So God's Holy Spirit, his glory, his power, his holiness that was on the Ark of the Covenant behind the veil just lifted up and moved out. God's, it's as if God said, all right, I'm leaving now. I'm not going to live in this mess. And he moved to the threshold, which is the gate or the door, the veil that separates the holy of holies from the holy place. And he stopped. And his glory filled that that outer perimeter, his, his, his holiness and his power and his grace filled a court. And you could hear even in, if you were on the outside, you could hear the angel wings flapping. And it's as if God stops and says, okay, I don't want to do this, but I'm leaving now. Does anybody care if I and my holiness and my glory leave. And he just hovers there at the threshold. I'm going to leave. I'm moving out. And he hovers there for a while and then his, his glory moves all the way to the gate the eastern gate of the temple that overlooks the Kidron Valley. And he stopped again. His glory has left the Holy of Holies, moved out over the holy place, stopped, hovered, waited. You could hear angel wings beating. All right, I'm going from here. I'm going from here. And then he went all the way to the gate and he stopped at the gate, the entrance into the sanctuary. And he stopped again as if to say, my holiness and my glory is leaving this church. You're not going to bring all that mess into my house and expect my holiness to stick around and expect my glory to fall on you. He's at the gate where you come into the house of the Lord and there he stops again as if to say bye-bye. Is anybody going to pray? Is anybody going to repent? Is anybody going to call on my holy name? No, no. So his glory left 
the temple, went across the Kedron Valley and stopped on the Mount of Olives as if to look back one more time and say, I'm gone now. Just one more shot at it and the glory of Almighty God is leaving this place. The next thing Ezekiel knows, he's in Babylonian captivity. Let me tell you something. God grabbed us when we were nobodies in Egypt, brought us through the wilderness, put up with our foolishness. He brought us into a Canaan land of his glory and his power and his presence. And somehow we've got the, the sense, we, we've got a sense that no matter what we do, God will never leave us. But I'm here to tell you God will pack his bags and pull out when people don't give him glory and honor and praise. Lift your hands and say, God, we don't want you to leave us. Oh, God, don't take your holiness from us. God, don't take your glory from us. Please don't leave us, God. I know we haven't lived right, done right, acted right. I know we make mistakes. I know we don't do like we should do. But oh, God, please don't ever take your glory from us. Don't ever let your holiness leave us. Give the Lord a hand of praise. The good news is, even though God picked Ezekiel up, he took him all the way back to Babylon where the children of Israel were. Children of Judah, children of Israel had been scattered to all the nations in the world by Assyria in 722 B.C. But the children of Judah and Jerusalem had been taken into Babylonian captivity in 587, and that's where Ezekiel was. The good news is, in the first and second and third chapter of Ezekiel, he had another vision. He was beside the river in captivity in Assyria. And what he saw the visions of God. God is not confined to Jerusalem. God is not confined to his temple. He's in Babylon and he saw the vision of God. You know what he saw? He saw angels flapping. They had four they had faces on all four sides of their head. Their wings were fluttering so much they, they bumped together. And right, right on the bottom of their feet was wheels that could travel in any direction. They didn't even have to turn their head and look. They already had a face looking that direction. They had a face looking that direction. They had a face looking that direction, a face looking that direction. And they had wheels 
on the bottom as if like their feet they had wheels that could just transport them anywhere any direction anytime and you know what was above them the throne of Almighty God and he who sat on it was holy 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 he can go anywhere anytime no matter where you are, you can get a vision of the holiness of God. One more vision he had was when he saw the glory coming back. God showed him the glory coming back to Jerusalem. He saw it come in the eastern gate, and he saw some changes. I don't have time to go into all this. That's what you get, Brother Garner, for just confining me to one hour. I'm telling you, I told you yesterday, I, I did that prayer conference. And my wife handed me her little watch. I couldn't tell what time it was. I preached through the break. And about 30 or 45 minutes into the next speaker's time. Aren't you glad we got a schedule? I'm going to tell you something. We've come to the place where we think no matter what we say, what we do, how we live, how we act, we can get by with it. We've been raised in this all of our lives and we've gotten more and more liberal. And we're free now. We've shaken off some of those shackles of that old priestly concept of holiness. We don't have to live by all those rules and laws and regulations anymore. Just bear this in mind. God can pack his bags and leave you anytime. Give the Lord a hand of praise.